So welcome everyone to this uh, last webinar of the year uh, organized by the Young Members Group of EFIB. Uh, the webinar is, uh, of today is about the dynamic and long-term behavior of concrete bridges and their live loads. So before starting, just a few information about the event. So um, the webinar will be recorded and then the video will be shared on the FAB social channels so on YouTube. So you can see again the recording. Um, during the event, only the panelists can speak. Uh, if you want to interact with us, uh, you can use the chat function where you can post some feedbacks about the event. Uh, but for technical questions about the um, presentation given by the speakers, we ask you uh, to use the Q&A form that you find at the bottom of your screen. Uh, so it's easier for us and also for you to monitor all the questions. Uh, the participation to this event is uh, completely free of charge. Uh, and if you want or need a certificate um, of the participation to the event, uh, you can contact uh, the FAB uh, publication office and also uh, you must attend at least the 60% of the event to obtain the certification. Uh, the cost of the certificate is of 10 uh, Swiss francs. Uh, if you want to get in contact with us, you want to follow our activities or engage and be uh, um, part of our uh, young members group, you can uh, follow us on Facebook and also um, join the group on the official FIB website. So we are happy to have new members. Now it's time to leave you to the speakers of today. And I leave the floor to the chair of the event, Professor Darko Nakov from University Ukim of Skopje. Please, Professor, the floor is yours. Good afternoon to everybody. Thank you for watching this webinar. Uh, I will introduce myself at the beginning. I am Associate Professor Darko Nakov, uh, coming from the Chair of Concrete and Timber Structures at the Faculty of Civil Engineering, Ukim University in Skopje. At the same time, I am Secretary General of our National Association of Structural Engineers. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have still a young members group, but maybe this will be the first step uh, towards forming one. So today we have two interesting presentations coming from uh, the teaching assistants at our chair, Smaria Docevska and uh, Dean Yanev. Uh, so I'm going with the next slide. Uh, I will present just briefly the research interests of our chair. So we have uh, more than 20 years uh, experience with long-term testing of full-scale beams made of uh, different types of concrete, so reinforced concrete, pre-stressed concrete, high-strength concrete, and fiber reinforced concrete, under uh, different complex realistic load scenarios with uh, sustained and repeated variable loads, which are acting certain amount of time during one day, which is actually the case uh, in reality. And our assistant, uh, Maria Docevska, actually will present her research work as a continuation of uh, our previous uh, research in this area of long-term behavior of uh, concrete bridges under live load. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we all also have uh, uh, a really big experience in uh, testing bridges. Uh, so only in the last five years, uh, we have performed more than uh, 60 proof loading tests on new or strengthened uh, reinforced concrete bridges. So we have uh, made uh, statical and dynamical uh, tests and we have collected uh, really a lot, uh, a lot of data. So our uh, other teaching assistant, Dean Yanev, will present his work actually in the area of uh, dynamic behavior of concrete bridges under live load. So only briefly, I will um, introduce them. So they are both uh, PhD candidates at the Ruhr University Bochum in Germany, but at the same time also they are making a part of their dissertation at our home university. They are both from North Macedonia. They are both teaching assistants from the last year uh, and 
of course, they are coming from our Faculty of Civil Engineering. Uh, they have different, similar or different interests. Uh, so Maria interests are in long-term behavior of concrete structures, concrete bridges, experimental testing, modeling of structural behavior, and their interests are structural concrete, concrete bridges, experimental testing, data analysis, uh, machine learning, signal processing, and dynamic of uh, structures. You can see their uh, contacts, Dotsevska uh, and Yanev, and uh, the rest is the same. Uh, so now I'm giving the screen to uh, Maria. Maria, please. Good, in, good evening to everybody. Uh, first, I would uh, like, in the name of uh, both speakers, uh, to uh, to express our sincere gratitude to all of you who are attending this webinar. My presentation will cover a topic on long-term behavior of concrete bridges under life loads. We are all uh, we are all aware that concrete bridges are one of the most creep-sensitive structures, but sometimes. In some cases, it is also important to consider the long-term behavior of bridges under life loads. Certain bridges, which are characterized by traffic load uh, with uh, duration that is, uh, that is close to the permanent load, can also suffer additional creep effects. Uh, typical typical uh, examples are city bridges in which, during the day, the traffic load is uh, present permanently while during the night, the structure is subjected only to dead loads. So uh, it seems uh, that the traffic load in this, uh, type of, uh, this type of bridges will continuously produce, uh, produce alternating loading and unloading cycles. During uh, the loading cycles, the structure will, uh, will exhibit additional creep due to the sustained part of the life load, uh, while under the unloading, part of this developed creep will be recovered. While there is an extensive literature about long-term behavior of uh, concrete under sustained load, there is still limited information about the behavior under repeated loads as traffic loads are. So the, uh, the ultimate aim of this uh, research is to provide experimentally, to provide a more realistic simulation of load histories that are typical for service life of this type of bridges. So my presentation will be focused on these four parts. I will briefly show some past and current research activities that are performed on the chair of concrete and timber structures from where I'm coming. Then the experimental program that is prepared on the material and element uh, level uh, as a part of my PhD project will be discussed. This presentation will cover the results obtained, experimental results obtained only on material level, and the conclusions from these results will serve later to elaborate the analytical background of the models for predicting long-term behavior of concrete under complex stress and uh, load histories. In the past uh, two decades at the Faculty of Civil Engineering in Skopje, uh, large experimental efforts uh, were dedicated on studying the behavior of concrete elements made of different type of concretes under repeated loads. All of these experiments have in common the uh, constant uh, variable amplitude and constant duration of the variable load over each subsequent cycle of loading within one considered loading history. In the current research, additional attempt uh, is made in order to uh, provide more uh, realistic loading scenarios, and the focus is uh, placed on different uh, types types of load histories that can be uh, that can be found in uh, bridges uh, like uh, like city like city bridges. Uh, the uh, three different groups of uh, of uh, load uh, patterns uh, are defined in the in the current uh, research program. The first and the most uh, a simple one is the uh, load, uh, load pattern where the amplitude of the variable load is constant over the time. Then the second one, when uh, there is <clears throat> a monotonically decreasing and monotonically increasing amplitude of variable load. And finally, uh, the last uh, load uh, pattern where the arbitrary distribution or random distribution of 
uh, of variable uh, load intensity is considered. It is, uh, it is important to mention here uh, that the cyclic pattern within one week is uh, similar and, uh, and keep uh, the same for all of these considered uh, different load scenarios. In all of these uh, researchers, uh, researches, the final aim is to define the, the portion of the variable load that is acting as a permanent or the so-called quasi-permanent load. Actually, Eurocode uh, 2 mentioned that this uh, quasi-permanent coefficient that defines the participation of the variable load into the permanent load is uh, depending only, uh, only on the duration of the life load as is pre presented here on this, uh, on this graph. But actually, it is not explicitly mentioned in the codes if the state of stresses in the elements under permanent load can really affect this value of quasi-permanent coefficient. Therefore, within uh, the experimental program in my PhD uh, project, uh, another variable is, uh, is implemented that is the level of the permanent load in terms of the cracking load. So half of the, uh, half of the beams will be exposed uh, to permanent load not, that does not produce uh, cracking and the cracks will be pr produced by total load and half of the beams exposed to the same uh, types of stress histories will be exposed to uh, permanent load that is higher than the cracking load. So it means that these beams will be cracked permanently during the whole testing period. But for, uh, for uh, calculation of long-term def uh, deflections under all of these complex uh, load scenarios, it was necessary to organize additional experiments on specimen level on material level in order to get more knowledge on creep and recovery phenomenon on concrete under uh, repeated stress histories. Therefore, at the Structural Testing Laboratory at Ruhr University in Bochum, two independent experiments were organized on specimen level. The first experiment aimed at assessing the influence of stress level of the repeated stress histories on the reversibility of creep, and the second one aimed at uh, checking the influence of the drying conditions of concrete on the reversibility under, uh, under similar repeated stresses. Within the first experiment, two individual stress histories were analyzed, one with full unloading and one with partial unloading. Both uh, stress histories were exposed to uh, different stress levels express as a fraction of the of the compressive concrete strength that is 30 percent in one case and 45 percent of uh, compressive strength in another case this level of uh, stresses are uh, are uh, decided uh, in terms of uh, in order to to stay in linear creep range in the second experiment two specimens one sealed in which the drying uh, was uh, not permitted and what was unsealed, which was allowed to dry during the test, were simultaneously subjected to uh, this uh, repeated stress histories comprised of loading and full or partial unloading. Just for comparison reasons, the regular stress uh, history with constant uh, stress uh, at loading and at the end of the test full unloading uh, was introduced, where also sealed and unsealed specimens were considered uh, simultaneously on this stress history. In the next slides, I will show you some uh, details about uh, both experiments, especially about the testing setup and the obtained results and conclusions. In the first experiment, where the stress level uh, was varied, for the specimens that uh, were subjected to full unloading, it was not necessary to use some special testing setup. The full unloading and the duration of the loading and unloading cycles allowed to use only one testing machine. So during the loading of one specimen under one stress level, the other was unloaded and vice versa. But for the next group of specimens which were subjected to partial unloading, it was necessary to develop this setup 
on the right hand side, uh, in which the steel eye girder was uh, introduced and the lever arm was uh, <clears throat> was adjusted in a way that the both uh, specimens are having the desired stress level that is actually 45% of uh, at loading or 30% and half of them at unloading. In this way, the this setup allows using one single machine uh, for simultaneous testing of both specimens under different stress, uh, stress histories. Uh, here are some uh, measured uh, results from the stress-induced uh, strains in concrete measured by strain gauges for specimens that were subjected to full unloading. So in each cycle of loading and unloading, uh, we, can, uh, we can see the, uh, the, the creep and the recovery increments at loading and unloading sequences. On the, <clears throat> on the right hand side, the diagram shows the specific uh, stress induced strains, which actually means that these measured uh, stress induced strains are uh, simply divided by the stresses that are, in, uh, that are applied on the specimens. And we can notice that despite the specific strains are somehow comparable for both stress levels, we can notice that here some uh, bigger residual specific strain uh, permits at uh, uh, specimens that were subjected to higher stress level, which indicates some nonlinearity under 40%, 45% of, uh, of loading in terms of the FC. But if we go uh, more uh, into the uh, creep increments in each loading cycles, and if we plot all these creep increments over time, then we can notice that as uh, we, we are expecting that the creep increments are uh, bigger uh, for bigger uh, stresses applied than for lower. But on the right hand side, if we compare the specific values of creep increments that are these creep increments divided by, by the stress that is applied, then we can, uh, we can uh, notice uh, that uh, this diagram indicates that they are comparable for both stress levels, except for some first few cycles of loading. If we make a similar, uh, similar comparison between the recovery increments during the unloading cycles, then similarly can be observed that the recovery increments, the absolute value of the recovery increments are higher for higher stresses. But again, the specific recovery increments are somehow similar for both stress levels, except in some cycles where a small uh, increase in uh, specific recovery appears under higher stresses. But what is uh, more important uh, in terms of uh, application of principles of reposition or, or, or other, uh, other methods uh, available in the literature, uh, it is important to, to compare the creep and the recovery increments in each uh, loading and unloading cycles. And what we can notice is that the creep increments, these triangles, have a tendency to reduce over uh, in, in each subsequent cycle, while the recovery is somehow more stable, which means that after sufficient number of loadings and unloadings, the recovery and the creep increments will become the same, which is actually uh, the, the principle, the, the, the basis of the principle of superposition. The creep should be uh, fully, uh, fully recovered, but this can be noticed only after sufficient number of loadings and unloadings. Now, uh, if we choose that the ratio between the recovery increment and the creep increment is a measure for a reversibility of creep in each cycles of loading and unloading, then we can notice that this ratio has a tendency to increase with number of cycles or with time, which actually shows that after sufficient number of loadings and unloadings, this ratio will become one. And one corresponds to full, fully recovered creep in the current cycle if subsequent unloading cycle happened. And this is noticed for both stress, uh, stress levels 
and for both specimens, one exposed to full and one to partial unloading. Here, the results obtained, uh, measure results uh, obtained on specimens subjected to partial unloading are presented. And these are stress-induced strains without the shrinkage effects. And similarly, like in the previous uh, group of uh, specimens exposed to, uh, to full unloading, we can notice that despite the, uh, the specific strain at loading is comparable for both stress levels, the residual strains after unloading is higher for higher stress level. Again, showing some non-linearity happening uh, at this 45% of, uh, of uh, FC that is a uh, limit between linear and non-linear creep. And here on the, on the right-hand side, uh, if we compare the recovery to creep increments in, the, in this uh, group of specimen exposed to uh, subjected to partial unloading. So this increment and this recovery increment, if we plot this ratio over time, we can notice that regardless of the stress level, this ratio is similar. And after sufficient number of cycles, it approach a value of 0 0.8. Here, it is worth to mention that it doesn't mean that the creep in this stress history under partial unloading is less recoverable than in the previous stress history where we considered full unloading. The reason why this ratio approach value of 0 0.8 and not one as in the previous case is the fact that in this load, this stress scenarios, during the partial, partial unloading, we are measuring uh, mixed strains creep recovery due to the unloading and ongoing creep due to the sustained partial, uh, partial load. Therefore, this it's uh, not a pure recovery. It's mixed of recovery and ongoing creep uh, due to the sustained, sustained stress at unloading. Therefore, the, the ratio here is maximum 0 0.8. Eight, but it doesn't mean that here creep is less recoverable than in the previous case. And what is interesting phenomenon that was recognized uh, from this uh, series of, uh, of experiments under full and under partial unloading is that actually the level of the unloading has an influence on the ability of concrete to creep in the subsequent cycles. So if we compare the blue light blue line that corresponds to full unloading and 45% of uh, stress. And if we compare the red one, which is again, 45%, but with partial unloading, then we can notice that in these steps where we have the same stress level, we have bigger ability of concrete to creep if the unloading is to zero, which suggests that the unloading level also has an influence on the ability of creeping in the subsequent, subsequent cycles of loading. In the next experiment, as I mentioned uh, before, the aim was to check if the drying conditions of the specimens can influence the uh, ability of concrete to, to, uh, to creep and to recover the, the developed creep in the previous cycles. Therefore, two different stress histories were analyzed. One stress history uh, that is a uh, uh, repeated one, comprised of cycles of loading and unloading with 12 hours duration. And for these stress histories, sealed and unsealed specimen, specimens mounted on the top of each other are placed in the hydraulic testing machine that is capable of applying such complex stress histories. And they were sim simultaneously exposed uh, to that history. Just for comparison reasons, the same uh, configuration of specimens with the same drying conditions were exposed to sustained load with the same level as in the cyclic load, but um, <clears throat> exposed to uh, one single unloading at the end of the test. And of course, for recording the uh, stress-free uh, strains 
of uh, specimens caused by autogenous drying shrinkage or some variation uh, in temperature and humidity. Uh, there were also uh, four companion specimens that were uh, placed near the uh, near the creep specimens just for uh, just for registering these stress-free strains. The graphic on the left-hand side showed the measured stress-induced uh, strains in all group of uh, specimens, both subjected to cyclic and subjected to sustained uh, stress and for both drying conditions, unsealed the orange one and sealed the green one. And it's more than obvious that uh, the specimens that are allowed to dry during the loading are uh, showing higher creep than, uh, than the sealed one. And this is expected because uh, in the unsealed specimen, we have, we have uh, additional drying uh, creep uh, that is in addition to the basic creep. Also for the stress-free specimens, the unsealed one showed higher stress-free strains in terms of the sealed one, which showed only autogenous shrinkage. But what is important uh, for us from this experiment was how uh, much the creep is reversible in each of these drying condition. And therefore, this plot shows the creep increments in each loading cycle for unsealed specimen and this one, the green one for sealed specimen. And continuously for the whole test, the unsealed specimen uh, exhibit higher creep increments than the sealed one. And this can be also concluded by comparing the sum of all creep increments in unsealed and in sealed condition. This difference is around 35%. But what is more interesting is that uh, somehow the recovery increments are less influenced by the driving uh, by the drying condition. They are higher for in some cycles. They are higher for unsealed specimen. But if we compare the sum of all creeping uh, recovery increments for sealed and unsealed specimen, then we can notice that the drying condition really have uh, 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 not that remarkable influence on the recovery behavior as it was the case with the creep recovery. And as a conclusion, we can say that drying condition under such uh, stress repeated uh, histories uh, has uh, have negligible influence on the recovery uh, of creep, but it has an influence on the amount of creep that is irreversible. Uh, in the literature, there are a few methods. Uh, there are a few methods available uh, which are capable of predicting creep and creep recovery under uh, under variable stresses. One is the principle of superposition, in which we are not able to implement separate functions for creep and for creep recovery, and the so-called two-function method that is developed by you and Tyre, where the creep where, where the creep um, of concrete is described by separate function than the recovery of concrete. Here in the principle of superposition, regardless uh, which method we are using, uh, method based uh, on product like model code 19 or method based on summation, model code 10, we are not uh, able to model uh, this behavior and this behavior with a separate function. Here, the recovery is considered as a negative creep, which is not the case in this uh, in this method, and here are some uh, co here are some uh, comparison between the measured uh, measured stress induced strains, one from one of the uh, specimen that we discussed before, exposed to thirty percent of of FC stress, and exposed to partial unloading, and the comparison is made by application of principle of superposition and by application of two-function method. And it seems that the principle of superposition can uh, follow, uh, can fit this, uh, this behavior, but at the end, some under tendency to underestimate the total strains can be observed. But on the right-hand side, the two-function method showed seemingly a good capturing of the behavior, but actually 
if we prolong this uh, this curve uh, with uh, obtained with two function method, then a calculative decrease of strains will appear after sufficient number of cycles of loading and unloadings because the recovery increments will dominate over the creep increments. And this showed the limitation of this method, method for such uh, frequently repeated stress histories. Here, there are two, uh, two slides for comparing the uh, calculated creep increments with both methods. So we can only conclude that the creep increments that is this uh, gray uh, cycles can be somehow followed by principle superposition by applying the formulation for uh, creep in model code 10 and also with two function method which uses again model code 10 formulation for creep but sorry but on the next slide we can notice that the recovery increments cannot be cannot be uh, predicted by any of these methods that were applied. So they're always overestimated regardless of the applied, applied method. And if uh, this uh, superposition principle that uh, was giving the, the best results for uh, material level experience was applied on the level of element in order to, uh, in order to predict the long-term deformations under this type of cyclic load histories, then we can uh, see that the calculated results comparing with the measure one, which are taken from the doctoral dissertation of Professor Arangelovsky, are, are good for some uh, first cycles, but then has a tendency to underestimate the, the deformation, the total deformation, the total deflection. The reason is because in this calculation, beta factor that is actually factor describing the reduction of tension stiffening due to the cyclic uh, load and long-term load, it's not um, suitable to be one during the whole test. And therefore, another calculation was done with beta 0.5 that is prescribed for cyclic and for long-term loads. But here we can see that with beta 0.5, we can overestimate the, uh, the uh, first uh, deflection, the, cycle, the deflections in the first cycles, but the results at the end are much better. And therefore, this model should be combination of both and should be found from which loading cycle it's okay to stay with beta one, which is prescribed for short-term loads, and from which uh, cycle to start with reduced beta 0 0.5, and also to find the uh, transition from one to 0 0.5. And this is uh, the last slide of my presentation, where instead of conclusions, I can just uh, mention my further steps. Uh, actually, a uh, further step of this research is the upcoming experiment on full-scale reinforced concrete beams that uh, will be exposed to 12 different loading scenarios, the ones that I uh, showed at the beginning of this presentation. And the next step is to apply this, uh, this analytical model that I already mentioned in order to verify the measured results. And uh, expected results from uh, the full-scale experiment are the following. Uh, the, the stress uh, and the, the load uh, histories that are uh, designed in the program uh, probably will give, uh, will give us the, uh, uh, the answer uh, on the question how the, uh, the loading history, the type of loading history can influence the quasi-permanent value of the variable load and also how the stress state under permanent load can also affect this value. Thank you for listening my presentation. This is the end of my presentation and now my colleague Dan will continue. Dan, please, the screen is yours.
Good evening to participants. As one of the speakers, I will present about the dynamic behavior of concrete bridges under life load. Sorry, the research as whole is composed of several chapters. First, the definition of dynamic amplification factor is given, and after that, dynamic proof load testing procedures are defined. Then methods for determining the DF are proposed, and from the collected results, we create a database, and from this database, which is collected from examination of a large number of bridge structures, structures, the aim is to form clusters of results to generate a meta model for predicting the DF without previously performing a dynamic proof load test on the bridges. The dynamic effect of traffic loads on roadway bridges is usually introduced to, through the so-called dynamic application vector. And this parameter shows how many times the impacts obtained from the, from the load static action are increased. The use of the dynamic application factor to consider the dynamic effect of moving loads on bridges is widely accepted in the design and analysis of bridge structures. And the DF is generally defined based on the maximum dynamic and static responses as given in the equations. Evaluation of the DF has received much attention from researchers and engineers in the field of bridge structures. But however, by the researchers and prescribed provisions in the regulations and standards, there is no consensus on how to determine the DF. The reason behind this is the large number of factors that affect the dynamic effects of moving load, like bridge span, road service condition, the velocity of moving vehicles and their moving trajectory, the weight and the number of axles of vehicles, and different measurement techniques and methods for processing results. We can confidently say that the accurate evaluation of the DF will lead to safer and cost-effective solutions for new bridges and provide real-world information for assessing the condition and managing existing bridge structures. Hence, the need to develop a more accurate method for determining the dynamic application factor. As a team from the Chair of Concrete Civil Engineering in Skopje, we have participated in proof load testing of more than 60 bridges that represent real scale experiments, from which static proof load testing of more than 60 bridges and dynamic proof load testing of about 30 bridges. Uh, these tests were performed on newly built or repaired strengthened bridges structures on different road sections on the territory of North Macedonia. The picture shows several characteristic constructions on which these testings have been performed. The main research framework consists of several vital steps, such as step one, define the dynamic proof load test program on bridge structures. The next step, step two, refers to the applied methods for calculating the dynamic amplification factor. The third step explains the procedures for collecting data from the bridge structures and creating a database. And at the last fourth step, the collected data is analyzed using machine learning techniques. This research focuses on several selected constructions, which are semi-prefabricated pre-stressed bridges with a static system simple bit. The dynamic proof load testing of the bridge structures is usually performed according to a predefined experimental program. The experimental program for testing of bridge structure consists of assessment of the condition of the bridge construction, defining the test moving load and application of measuring equipment and selection of measuring points. In this step, a classification of the type of bridges covered by the research was performed. Additionally, as a necessary condition for conducting the dynamic proof load testing, the bridge to be examined needs to be entirely constructed and built, and it is emphasized that the bridge approaches must be completed for the dynamic testing of bridges. Also, the design project and other technical documentation are expected to obtain the necessary information such as the geometric shape of the structure and the dimensions of the structural elements, the age of the construction, the calculate influence in critical section, and the calculate values of the crack openings, the size of the vertical deflection, and other parameters of the serviceability limit state. Also, we should check the provided quantity, layout type, 
and characteristics of the embedded materials, and if we should check other relevant data that is necessary to book quality testing. Before the start of the test, a detailed inspection of the structure should be performed. And in the case that everything is in order after the inspection, it can be concluded that the geometric shape and dimensions of the structural elements correspond to those given the design project. Then the dynamic examination can begin. The dynamic tests were performed with a moving proof load, a heavy vehicle with a different gross weight from a minimum value of 31.7 tons and a maximum value of 36.6 tons. And here the vehicle has four axles, two rear and two front, at a distance from each other, shown as in the figure on the right side. So we can see the proof load vehicle while performing the dynamic proof load testing on the shown pictures. And in table one, it shows that structure response obtained depending on the shim and pace of load. Uh, we have three phases. The first phase is with an empty bridge for measuring the natural frequency. The second phase is with two kilometers per hour speed of movement to the proof load for measuring the quasi-static response. And the third phase with a speed of motion of the proof load from 10 to 40 kilometers per hour for measuring the dynamic response. Equipment used during the test is its accuracy and its disposition on the structure should meet the needs of the test. In this dynamic proof load tests, we use the following measured equipment, such as data acquisition system for registering and recording measured quantities over time, electronic deflection meters with an accuracy of 0 0.1 to 0. 0.001 millimeters for measuring vertical deflections, and we use drone for an aerial recording of the structure's geometry and recording the dynamic testing process with a proof load. Before starting the test, it is necessary to check that the used measuring instruments are correct and calibrated. This figure shows an example of the location of measuring equipment for a characteristic bridge structure under test and usually for constructions with a simple beam static system, the measuring equipment is placed in the middle of the span of the girders. Vertical displacements of each main girder were measured through which the DF can be calculated. Due to the low original stiffness of the cross section, it is expected that the relevant values for the calculated date will be obtained from the measuring instruments located in the influence zone as it's shown in the cross-section A. Uh, here, drone video recordings were used to determine the actual speed and trajectory of the moving proof load as shown in this video. They're subject to additional processing with computer vision techniques, which allow us to determine the speed and trajectory of the movement over time with a sufficient accuracy. When beginning the examination of the DF of the bridge structures, firstly a static and dynamic proof load testing should be carried out. The maximum value of the dynamic response is usually obtained from the measured signal acquired during the dynamic proof load test. And the determination of the maximum value of the static response can be done using the following methods. Conducting a quasi-static proof loading where the proof load moves across the bridge at a language speed and the second method is filtering the measured dynamic response with a low pass filter to eliminate the signal's dynamic components. After the dynamic proof load test of the bridges is carried out, it proceeds to the post processing of the measured signals. In general, the proposed methods for processing the measured signals and obtaining the BF are based on several vital procedures. This viewer through a flowchart illustrates the method used to process the measured signals and obtain the DF. Firstly, we start by measuring the dynamic response of the bridge structure caused by the moving life load. With the proper data acquisition system and reliable displacement sensors, we can record the measured signals and proceed to the next step for signal processing and analysis. After the constructions perform dynamic measurements, the results are obtained as a row measured signals in the time domain. And during the measurement itself, the row measured signals are followed by 
unwanted interference or noise. In order to remove these obstacles, um, these primary signals, signals are subject to additional processing. And for the needs of their additional processing, appropriate methods for processing analysis of signals are applied, such as EMD, empirical method, empirical mode decomposition for the composition of the signal in a time domain, which is a signal processing method that breaks down a signal into components of series of sums of functions. And with the application of the EMD, the goal is to obtain several EMF components that have different frequencies. And the second mode and the second method is using FFT or test for transform algorithm for the transformation of the signal from a time to a frequency domain. And this transformation is necessary because signal processing is more straightforward in the frequency domain. The next step is to obtain the cutoff frequency of measured dynamic signals. The cutoff frequency of measured dynamic signals are obtained using the FFT algorithm. They are used to find the right total frequency to remove unwanted obstacles from the measured signal and a value higher then the value of the natural frequency of the structure is usually adopted. The static cutoff frequency are also determined using the FFT algorithm, and they're used to find the right filter frequency to remove the dynamic component from the major dynamic signal, and usually we adopt a value smaller than the value of the natural frequency of the structure. The filter efficiency depends on three factors that are the type, order, and direction of filtration. Uh, there are different types of digital low-pass filters that are commonly used, are Butterworth, Elliptic, Chebyshev, Type 1, Type 2, and there are more, more uh, low-pass filterings. And also the order of the filter defines the, the slope of the transmission function around the frequency that will be removed. And it is recommended to use a higher order filter because it contributes to have a sharper transition between unfiltered and filtered frequencies. Uh, also, the, the signal can be filtered forward, backward, or forward and backward at the same time. So simultaneous backward and forward filtering is applied to minimize distortion in the single phase and to avoid the phase progression. Low-pass filtering is used for removing the dynamic component from the measured dynamic signal. And if we subtract the static from the dynamic signal, we can obtain the dynamic component of the signal, as shown in the right side P. In addition to this, the next step from the chart is to obtain the maximum static response. To obtain the maximum static response, the dynamic signal is filtered with a low-pass filter that blocks all frequencies above the static cut of frequency. And from the filtered static response, the peak value is used as a maximum static response. After that, we should obtain the maximum dynamic response. Firstly, the raw dynamic measured signal is filtered to remove the unwanted obstacles from the measured signal. And next, the peak value from the dynamic signal is used as a maximum dynamic response. The last step of this flowchart representing this method is to calculate the value of the dynamic amplification factor. The DF is calculated as a ratio between the maximum dynamic and static response values as shown in the stated equation. In addition, by example, the application of this method for calculating the DAF is shown. So the structure's natural frequency is obtained using the IMD method and the IFT algorithm. The EMD method decomposed by decomposed the measured signals to identify and exclude the signal components followed by unwanted obstacles. And this, and this method works on the principle that as the order of decomposition increases, each EMF component frequency gradually decreases. So the first EMF component contains the highest frequency, while the last EMF component contains the lowest frequency of the signal. The removal of the first few high frequency EMF components from the original signal can be considered as same as filtering with a low pass filter. And the next method is using the FFT algorithm. Uh, this algorithm is applied to the primary signal to transform it from time to a frequency domain and 
Combining these two methods allows more accurate identification of the structural natural frequency. The natural frequency is a good indicator for further determining the cutoff frequencies required to filter measured dynamic signals. As we said before, uh, the static response can be obtained by filtering the measured dynamic signal with a low, low pass filter. On the left side figure, we have the filtered static response, and on the right side figure, there is dynamic response obtained from the dynamic proof load test. We can obtain the measured signal's dynamic component by subtracting the static from dynamic response shown in the left side bottom corner figure and on the figure on the right side bottom corner. Simultaneously, we can see the static and dynamic response and the removed dynamic component. The next step is database creation. When creating the database, several vital criteria are observed. Uh, the road surface condition is first assessed using the algorithm shown on the right. And depending on whether expansion joints are placed and whether the pavement is concrete or asphalt, the road surface condition can get two values, bad or good. The second criterion covers the vehicle properties, such as vehicle gross weight, vehicle speed, moving trajectory, number of axles, distance between axles, and Again, frequency of the wheel. When testing the bridge structure, these parameters often vary and they can be different. Material properties represent the third criterion. They are covered through compressive strength of concrete, modulus of elasticity of concrete, modulus of rigidity of concrete, pre stressing tendons, and percentage of reinforcing steel. The fourth criterion includes the geometric characteristics of the structure separated in two groups. The first group includes variables related to the longitudinal direction of the bridge, such as spawn length, skew angle, and longitudinal elevation. And <clears throat> the second group of variables related with the cross-section of the bridge deck that are total bridge width, slab depth, number of girders, girder depth, distance between interior girders, and super elevation of the deck. To reduce the number of variables, we replace all of the second group variables with only three of them, like area, moment of inertia, and torsional constant. <coughs> uh, this table shows an example of created database that contains the above variables, including in the road surface condition, vehicle properties, material properties, and geometric characteristics. And in this, database, in this database are included results from 15 different girder bridge structures. Um, the next step or step four is data analysis. Analyzing the data is based on the procedure given in the chart flow diagram. To select the data first, we have to plot each variable parameter with the response. And from that visual representation, we can decide what data we will use. When the data is selected, we can use the multiple linear regression method to find the relationship between the parameters and the response. And after fitting the data, we can create an equation for predicting the response itself. And also we can use response surface methodology plots to show the relationship between the parameters and the response. Um, the first row shows graphs of the DF as response <coughs> and variable parameters such as span length, moment of inertia about the bending axis, weight and speed of the vehicle. And these graphs are from all the results that have been previously processed and collected in the database. And after that, we make classification of results using the previously mentioned algorithm for assessing the road surface condition. Uh, they are divided based on whether the road surface is bad, that are graphs in the second row, and if the road surface is good, that are third row graphs. Because there is, is a significant variation results of the second row graphs, for the application of the method for multiple linear regression, the results were where the condition of the road surface is good are used. From the performed analysis and the obtained statistical parameters, applying a 
cubic models recommended. And if we look at the general equation for the cubic model, we can conclude that if all members are taken hierarchically, the equation takes a very complex form. And to reduce the complexity of the equation, it is decided to remove some of the terms guided by the statistical parameter PVL. Uh, the modified model increases the accuracy compared to the cubic model, and its advantage is the simplicity of the equation. In table three, the analysis of variance for the model is given, and from here we can conclude that the model a value implies that the model is significant. Um, if values less than 0 0.05 indicate that the model terms are significant. In this case, we have few significant model terms and values greater than 0 0.1 indicate that the model terms are not significant. And if we have uh, many insig insignificant model terms, we can try to make a model reduction that may improve the model. Also, the lack of fit implies that the, implies that is not significant. And this not significant lack of fit is good because we want the model to fit. In table four, we can see the R squared values. And R squared is the coefficient of multiple determination for this multiple regression. And Higher expert views represent more minor differences between the observed data and the fitted values for the same data set. Uh, the value of R squared equal to 0.76 explain, explains 76% of the variation in the response variable around its mean. On the left side figure, from the normal probability plot of residuals, we can see that all residuals from the regression model are nearest of all the straight line. And predicted versus actual values of the dynamic application factor from the regression model are shown on the right side. And from this plot, we can notice that we lack data for the values of DF between 1.15 and to 1.30. And also we can notice that there is concentration of the data between 0 0.9 and 1.10. Here equation 3 represents the final equation for prediction of the BF reduced cubic model and using the proposed equation we can graphically represent the relationship between a response variable and a set of variable parameters. With many variables the graphical display is always a problem so this slide graphically shows the response area conserving only two variables. The first variable in all graphs is the span length, while the second variable changes according to the values of the moment of inertia, weight, and speed of the vehicle. In the shown plots, considering the relationship between the weight of the vehicle and the speed of movement, and also the moment of inertia, it can be seen that there is an approximately linear dependence between them. Since I'm still at the beginning for, of my research on this topic, guided by what has been done so far, the ideas for upgrading and further research would go in the following direction. For upgrading of measuring equipment, we can try to make acceleration measurements during dynamic proof load tests, and we can try to measure the true geometry of the structure. Also, in the during proof loading, we can try using different proof load a vehicle with different number of axles, three, four, and five, and different weight. Also, we can make a database addition with filling the data gap with more extensive range of values for the parameters. And we can take the real material properties of structure to be used in these models. And also we can conclude the analytical and numerical analysis of vehicle bridge interaction. And maybe we should try different methods, methods for data analysis. 
first to try to optimize and improve the accuracy of prediction of the linear regression model and to try to implement neural networks and deep learning. And then both speakers would like to acknowledge to the team of the Chair of Complete Structures from Faculty of Civil Engineering Skopje, which made this experimental testing possible and the uh, founding support provided by Roof Research School, which made this research a possible undertaking. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thanks also to Maria for your presentations. Now we are uh, at the stage of question and answers. So uh, we have one comment and one uh, question till now. So uh, from Professor Balash from uh, Technical, uh, from Budapest University of Technology, we have uh, one comment. Dear Maria, congratulations for your interesting research. And then we have one um, question uh, related to page 14 it, from the presentation. So you mentioned that creep should be fully recovered. Does it depend on the stress level? Professor Bala, thank you for the comments and the question. I mentioned that the creep will be fully recovered after sufficient number of loading and unloading, uh, which uh, is shown here for both stress levels. So it seems that uh, under 30% and 40, 45% of FC, that uh, the behavior is similar in terms of the reversibility of uh, creep in the subsequent unloading cycle. So here, uh, the triangle shows the uh, creep increment in some further creep, uh, in some further loading uh, cycle, and the, uh, the, the cycle uh, sign shows the, uh, the recovery increment in the subsequent unloading cycle. And they, they are very close, and therefore we can conclude that in the later uh, cycles of uh, loadings and unloadings, the creep will be fully recovered for this considered to stress. Uh, stress levels. Okay, thank you, Maria. We are expecting some more questions. Also regarding the end presentations. Presentation. Uh, okay, in the meantime, I can uh, start one discussion maybe until we are waiting, Maria. Uh, in Eurocodes, uh, there, are, there is a semi-probabilistic uh, method, actually, of determination of this quasi-permanent coefficient. And uh, here you are making an attempt to find this coefficient uh, experimentally. So what are your expectations, especially regarding the, the value of these coefficients? What, uh, is it prescribed, let's say, in the standards and with which intensity? Uh, so uh, the thing is that in the Eurocode, it is mentioned that the C2 coefficient, that is quasi-permanent uh, coefficient of load, is uh, dependent only on the total duration of the, uh, of, the life, uh, of the life variable load that I showed on my, uh, some of my first slides. So uh, I will show again just to explain it better. Uh, this is what is prescribed in the standard. Uh, so the value of the quasi-permanent coefficient is uh, corresponding to the level of the uh, level of the variable load uh, that actually has 50 it's 50 percent present from the whole considering uh, time period which is actually the service life of the structure and this is the only explanation for the value of uh, of uh, quasi-permanent coefficient uh, it is not explicitly mentioned uh, how the, the other parameters uh, can influence this value, uh, like, uh, like I mentioned, the uh, stress uh, state under permanent load. Does it uh, uh, cracked under permanent or it's uncracked uh, under permanent load? So expectations, uh, I don't know, but, but uh, probably, uh, probably for such uh, stress uh, histories where we have intensive uh, intensive load at the beginning, where the creep is more intense and it's more pronounced, 
probably in this uh, load uh, histories we will we we should ex we sh should need to expect expect higher uh, C two coefficients than in this uh, in so, sorry in these cases. Okay. Thank you for the answer. We are still waiting some comments or questions. <clears throat> Maybe one uh, question or discussion with uh, Dean also. Uh, Dean, uh, what have you found out till now in your research? So what are the differences, let's say, between your proposed model and already given expressions in the design codes regarding the dynamic amplification factor? Um, thank you for the question, Professor Darkwa. Uh, until now in my research, as I showed in the presentation, we input more parameters that are uh, that are correlated to the dynamic application factor. And in cooperation with the design codes, we can see that in some codes, the dynamic application factor is a function only from the span length. And in some codes, there is that the dynamic application factor is only a function of the frequency of the structure. And also in some codes like Eurocode and I think America codes, the dynamic application or the impact of the moving vehicle is already included in the in the vehicle itself. So from here, I think that including all other parameters as vehicle speed, weight, and I think the most important is the road surface condition because if we have newly built structure with good road surface condition like no damages on the on the, the bridge deck. So here we will get a lower a lower value of the dynamic amplification factor. And if there is an old uh, bridge structure with some damages and cracks or openings on the on the road surface, we can get highly value of the dynamic amplification factor. So I think this is the main difference between the design codes and this research. So pavement conditions will be uh, will be let's say will have the biggest influence. Is your yes? Point. I think the biggest influence at the value of the of the dynamic amplification factor will be in the condition of the pavement. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have one more question from Balin Somlai for Maria. Uh, is there any known way to increase the creep recovery of concrete? Uh, I, my, my research is focusing on uh, influence of different, uh, let's say, uh, stress histories on the uh, on the amount of creep recovery. And from from this uh, research, what I notice is that the creep recovery maybe can be reduced, which means more creep recovery, if uh, we uh, postpone the uh, first age at first, uh, the, the age at first loading of the concrete, because uh, there are also some available uh, results which are showing that the later the age of first loading, the higher is the reversibility of creep. Or also if the duration of the sustained load, in our case, it was uh, a life load, is uh, lower, then the creep is also uh, uh, has uh, the recovery uh, is bigger, which means that the creep is more recoverable if the duration under sustained load is less. So from this aspect, by increasing the uh, age of concrete at first loading and also by reducing the duration of the sustained uh, load, the variable sustained load, uh, in this way, the uh, creep recovery can be increased uh, and I, I'm not sure uh, if I uh, answered uh, in the right way because it's, uh, the question is general, but in terms of what I am considering in my research, this is, uh, these are the only possibilities to, to increase the re recovery of creep. Okay, thank you. We have one more uh, 
based from Abhinav Vardhan we have in the chat, based on the research, can any comment be made on long-term fatigue behavior or damage due to random loads? Long-term fatigue behavior or damage due to random loads? I, I just want to emphasize that the loading uh, scenarios that we are considering here are actually uh, not uh, uh, scenarios that are producing uh, fatigue uh, effects. These are more longer term uh, changes of the variable load and this produce uh, only additional creep during the sustained uh, variable load. And uh, I'm not uh, in the field of, uh, of fatigue effects. Maybe if there are not, no more questions, I would have uh, one question or a comment to uh, the work of Maria. It's actually a very nice work because, um, as uh, Professor Darkonakov said before, the euro codes, they only take into account um, for effects when we have initial loading, uh, either it be 30 or 45% for new structures. But this work can, um, is, is actually a one step closer to interpreting increasing loads with the history of a structure. Because if you think about bridges, after some refurbishment, uh, they add new, um, new asphalt and also the, um, the life loads also increase over the, the, uh, the age of the structures. So usually we plan bridges for, I don't know, 80, 100 years. And uh, the actual loads of, 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 of trucks, the trucks are getting bigger with technology. So this is a very good uh, way to, to cover all these realistic structures. So maybe my question would be, uh, how important is it to, to consider the increase of the permanent load during the lifetime of the structure? So basically maybe at the beginning you charge with 30% and then mm -hmm. later you should charge with 45%. This is... Uh, Maybe an aspect, but yes, thank you. Very nice presentation. Thank, thank you, Darko, for, for your kind uh, words, but also for, for your uh, comment, because actually with uh, uh, part of, uh, of my experimental program, I will cover this uh, uh, scenario where at the beginning, where the structure is still younger, uh, young and uh, it has a uh, big ability uh, to creep. Uh, in that uh, period, we have uh, uh, less uh, intensity of variable load and uh, after that it increases. So I have a staircase uh, load scenario, which is increasing and decreasing. So actually the increasing one can uh, cover this aspect that you mentioned, the increased uh, intensity of the traffic uh, load during the lifetime of the, uh, of the bridges. Yes, thank you very much. Actually, this uh, staircase load scenario is very realistic and that would have been my second comment is because when we build a structure, we don't build it at once. The permanent load is not there mm -hmm. uh, overnight. We usually have stages of construction. So we increasingly add the permanent load. So to, I also see a big potential in your work for, for describing this scenario, which is very realistic. And then mm -hmm. maybe also one question to Dayan, if I may allow myself. Um, you have shown Dayan some very nice uh, pictures of um, and then uh, picture material of the bridges that you have inspected or that you have collected data from in, in load testing, both static and, and dynamic load testing. Um, my question is a bit more general because I'm not so familiar with your, uh, with your topic, but uh, where are all these bridges? Are these all in the Balkans? I assume that they're not all in Macedonia or... Uh, and and the second question to that would be how long uh, did it take you to collect all this data? Because uh, in one PhD, I think the big issue is also how long do we have for the experimental campaign? And, and was it a, a big hassle for you? Thank you very much. Thank you, Darko, for the question. Uh, I will correct you. All the bridges are in the territory of North Macedonia, and they are all newly, brick, newly, newly brick built bridges. So. Uh, only a few of them are repaired and strengthened. And in the last five years, we, we as I said in the beginning, we have tested uh, more than 60 bridges with static uh, proof load and more than 30 bridges with dynamic proof load. And I started collecting the data, I think, two years ago. And I continuously upgrading it when we 
when we make new new testings on new constructions. So I think it's it's a very long process because we have to collect all of the data and it's really a big data. Okay, maybe one more tricky question, but uh, when we load bridges to test them and to test deflection, is there a limit that we have to respect because also in some, let's say, the limit between um, linear elastic limit and cracking can be very thin and is it good to crack structures just to test deflections? It's a bit of a provocative question, but it's something yeah. which is uh, concerning me a lot also in, in the world of practice. Yes, in the, in the beginning when we, when we started with the testing of the bridges, first we made a testing procedure program and here we defined the, the weight of the vehicle. So mainly we use for the static uh, testings, we use four or two vehicles. And here the weight is, I think, 0 0.8 from the life load that will be present on the, on the bridge. So for the pre-stress pre concrete bridges, because we have total pre-stressing, we don't expect cracks, but for reinforced concrete bridges, I think we will have a cracks from the, from the the, from the vehicles that we use for, for flow testing. So I think it's not good to, only for the, the load testing to make a cracks in the, in the main areas of the bridge. Thank you very much and congratulations to both of you for the very good work. Thank you. Thank you, Darko, for your questions. We have one comment from Professor Balash on the question uh, regarding fatigue behavior and damage to random loads. Uh, Professor Balash said, I think yes, depends mainly how many large amplitudes are included in the random loading. This is the comment of Professor Balash to this question. The question was posted by Abhinav Vardan. Okay, there are no more questions and comments. So I think we can conclude this webinar here. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for watching and being connected online to this webinar. And uh, I hope to see you in some other occasion. Goodbye and good night.